This morning's gospel reading is the Annunciation from Luke. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The word of God for the people of God. Let's pray. Spirit of God falls fresh on this moment of preaching and sharing. May the words of my mouth, may the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Dear Lord, my strength and my redeemer, in Jesus' name, amen. I constantly remind myself, Daryl, slow down so people can understand what you're saying. Being a, okay, amen, all right. Now I, now, I get a, now I get an amen. Let me be transparent. And I'm learning, as, and I'm constantly evaluating my posture and purpose as a pastor. Two things I want to share with you in, in light of that. One, when I, if I were to tell you the thing keep me up at night as a pastor, the one thing I do is my soul, my soul, my soul. The business of the church has its own challenges, but that's par for the course, and I'm willing to accept that. But what troubles me sometimes is that when I know that I've hurt somebody's feelings, it, it vexes my soul, and, 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 I pray, and I'm often in prayer that God continue to show me how to be sensitive to people. The second challenge, if you will, that I have or the thing I want to share is I have to work at being a good pastor. Let me say to you, my friends, that it, it does not come as easy for me. Uh, I, I'm, I'm an introvert, I'm a loner, if I had it my way, I would just sit at home all day by myself, watch TV or read. And the work of ministry requires that I pastor. It requires that I visit and call and connect with people who need the attention of, of, of a pastor. And for the last 30 years of preaching and 20 years of pastoring in my prayers that I write, I'm constantly petitioning for God to strengthen my ability and knowledge and wherewithal to be a good pastor. Preaching comes a little easier. It often it often breaks my heart sometimes when people 
when they evaluate my ministry, they say, well, you are a good pastor, a good preacher. And I'm, I want to I hear, am I a good pastor, though? Because preaching is a 20-minute, maybe 25 minutes, <laughs> thing I do once a week. But if that was all that was required, the church would be in trouble. So preaching is good, but I ask God to instill within me something that is not as easy to come by. I want to be honest with you about that. that but I also want to share with you that I'm in constant prayer about that, that I desire for that which is not already easy or in me, that for God to put it and endow me to do ministry. And even though I don't have that talent, you, but you know what? You're supposed to say what? <laughs> I believe in Daryl. You know why I believe in Daryl? <laughs> because of our text today. Luke 1, these verses that Julie read to us. Come with me this morning and look at this text through a new lens. You're probably wondering how could that text provide for you, Daryl, hope that even though you, don't, you may not have this capability as well as you want, how does this text help? I'm glad you asked. Let's look at it. The text reminds us that a messenger named Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee named Nazareth to a woman named Mary with this announcement, you will give birth to a son. It's the subsequent conversation that happens after that announcement that I want to give you my attention for the next few minutes. Feminist biblical scholar Jane Shaber says, Mary, when she asked the question, how can this be? How can it be possible for you to tell me that I'm with the child, I will be with the child, I will have this moment of being impregnated. How could this be when I have had no sexual relations with any man? Schauber says that the phrase, how could this be, should be interpreted, how will this be? Because in interpreting it this way, she says that it is the possibility of it happening the, or rather the possibility of this thing happening is not predicated on Mary's previous experience or the endowment of what it takes for such an occasion to happen that Mary is curious. This is not my experience. How will it be that I can have this possibility. Mary's reaction is based on what she has never experienced without considering the promise of what God says can happen. And so it's typically the case, I give you three points. I'm gonna give you three, I'm gonna give you two of them right now for the next three or four minutes. I want to give you three points. The first point is that I want to share with you your gift. My second point is that I want to share with you is your gift. And then the third point is I want to share with you one sentence that reflects on those two first points. Listen to the words of the angel or the messenger that says to Mary, 
But she raises the concern and query, how can this be? And the angel says, for two reasons. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Give me a few minutes to sort of contextualize those two words, those two phrases. The Holy Spirit, number one, he's, that the messenger says will come upon you. The Greek word for that phrase is epicho made. Don't worry about it, don't worry about it. But, but know that it is in the active voice in the Greek. I'll come back to that, it's important. And then he says, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. I'm not gonna say that Greek word, but I will tell you that it's also in what the Greek calls the middle voice. Give me a few minutes, this is, I, think, I think it would be helpful. The active voice in the Greek is when the subject is acting on behalf of the object. So when the messenger says the whole, the, 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 that the Holy Spirit will come upon you, active voice, which means the Holy Spirit will do whatever it's doing to you for your benefit. And then it says the most high will overshadow you. That's the middle voice, whereas the active voice says that the action of the subject, that is the Holy Spirit coming upon her, is doing it for Mary's benefit. But overshadowing in the Greek, in the middle voice, is when the, is when the subject is not acting on behalf of the object, namely Mary, but watch this, on behalf of the subject itself. So when the Spirit overshadows her, whatever the Spirit is doing is doing it for the sake of the Holy Spirit. In other words, God is, or the, is sending the word to Mary, you, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and give you a gift, will give you a gift. Yes, it's not your experience, but just because you have an experience that Mary doesn't mean that it can't happen, it's a gift. And it's doing it for your benefit because you have favor with God, but then the Most High will overshadow you that gift that the Holy Spirit gave you turns into a gift that you also use to glorify God. So you get a gift, which is what God gives you, but then you take that gift and you share it and use it to help others. It's a gift. You don't, and, and I came up with a different definition of gift. I, I, you know, we usually talk about gifts we talk about them as extraordinary endowments as evidenced by a talent we possess. Barry singing or Alan Strauss' gift to preach or Wendy's gift of creativity or Tracy Wise's gift to write. Those are talents, but a gift is something you end up, ha you possess that you didn't have before. And Mary is impregnated with a possibility despite what her experiences says. And when that gave, when that angel came to her that the Holy Spirit will come upon you, the Holy Spirit will bless you with a gift, and then the Most High will expect for you to use that gift to bless other people. So the same angel, Gabriel, that stopped by the town in Galilee called Nazareth, can stop by a little city in California that sits on this corner and give you a gift to bless others. If you want to be a blessing, take, ask God to endow you with something or ministry that maybe you haven't had before, but just because you don't possess it today doesn't mean that God can't endow you to have it tomorrow. The same angel that promised Mary that she would be a blessing because of God's gift also says to her to use that gift for God's glory. So remember, beloved, that God will endow you with gifts to do amazing things, to change people's lives, so God's gift is expected for you to be a gift. And remember, a gift blesses. It doesn't hurt. If it hurts, it's not a gift. If it puts people down, it's not a gift. If it's abusive, it's not a gift. 
If it's judgmental, it's not a gift. If it's condescending, it's not a gift. Why? Because a gift encourages. A gift lifts people up. A gift inspires. A gift brings joy to people. And when you pray for God to bless you with gifts to do God's work, Mary says, the angel says, the angel says to Mary that the thing that God has impregnated you with, it will be a blessing. Whatever gift God impregnates you with, use it to be a blessing to others. Let me close with this third point, that when you receive this gift, or whatever that gift is, to be a gift, and when you receive that gift that is a gift, you will be, and we will be, gifts that keep on giving. The word of God for the people of God.